All right, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate the practical part of doing an ear impression on fake things, which should propagate to real things. There are whole lists of safety questions and stuff that you'll be learning in the more didactic part of the course. But for this, let's just talk about the materials a little bit that you're gonna be using. There are impression syringes. The stubby ones, if you have a little tiny hand, do let me know, but these are kind of my personal ones because tiny hands. Um, these are your basic generic ones. These are Dr. Howard's favorite ones, but they all have the same purpose, which is to put the silicone epoxy in and then squeeze it. It starts out back here though. As you can see, I can't quite reach it. And you'll also be learning about um, electric and gun style, uh, but for today we'll be just doing syringe. The manual ones. Um, you will also need a pen light and a probe tip, and these will be in your ear impression kits, and you will be responsible for them for the whole semester and turn them in at the end of the semester. And then there will be little fake ears in your kit. Um, there are not enough heads, so those will have to be checked out and checked back in and swapped around when you get to the head. The other thing is Odo blocks, and there are a variety of materials and sizes. So we have foam ones, and these are small and medium. And they say it on the opposite side. So if you're not sure what size they are, there's also shorter ones, uh, which I don't know if we have those. Thin blocks, They're... we do have, those are not for you. No, no, but they exist and there's cotton, uh, cotton blocks as well. Uh, you'll find some sites actually make their own blocks from cotton and string. I don't know if that's going to be a common occurrence now in the time of COVID, honestly. Um, these are the thin, thin blocks. Tops. So you see how they're, oh, oh about half the size the in the actual thickness and then there's some cotton ones and they all come in all different sizes mm -hmm. you're gonna find that dr howard and i are fans of cotton uh dr burns and i think dr redding are more fans of foam uh, i personally will say the reason i like cotton is you can fray you can splay out those ends and it helps catch the sides of the walls in a way to me that helps um it does not move as fluidly and as consistently probably though as foam, which is why I think many people like foam. And I like foam because I have problems with my vision and depth. And so I have learned to differentiate the light refractions off of the foam when you do it in there. Um, so I can tell whether it's filled better. Mm -hmm. um, it works for me. Plus, um, I have intention tremors, and so with the foam, I have better feedback. So, But you'll have your own preferences, too. And I'll mention also that some sites will use like an Odoese or something on the actual blocks when they put them in. The issue with that is that you're causing uh, there to be some fluidity that wouldn't be there otherwise. And so when you go to put in your impression material, it may cause more chance of blow by where you actually push the block either down to the ear canal or it goes around the block and gets to the eardrum, which is what we don't want to happen anyways. So those are the Odo blocks. Um, this is an example of the silicone epoxy. Um, there, it's a two-step process. It starts to harden when you start mixing these. So you'll notice that the spoons are color coded like white is always white blue will go to green or purple or whatever the other color is for the material and you do not need to cross contaminate so when you're working with them what i recommend is you open it you put the lid down and i did sanitize my hands before i touched you put your scoop on the proper colored lid and keep track of it that way and you'll be learning about other potential types of materials and different ways of mixing. Today, we're just gonna do standard hand mixing, um, but there are split methods and there are different different ways to even load your actual um, syringe that we'll talk about when we get to the di didactic part. But for today, we're doing pretty standard, pretty uh, typical um, 
ways of doing an air impression. Now, hand mixing, the only rule for this is you cannot use powdered or latex gloves, particularly powdered latex gloves. Your material will not set. Nitrile should be fine. Nitrile, as long as they're, they're powder-free, are fine. And we do get, usually, powder-free nitrile. But that's why I pointed out the powdered. Um, with COVID going on, what we may be able to get may differ from what we usually do. So always double check if you're going to use gloves to get a powder-free one. Um, Otherwise, you just... going to contaminate? It's going to make your hands kind of gross and oily, but... Again, it just make sure you're sanitizing your own hands first before before you do it. So you do, and under real life conditions, you would sanitize before you grabbed out of the Odo blocks. You would do otoscopy, and we moved everything to get it out of the way and then we she, needed it. She's going to get a otoscope. I am. I had it out and everything, and then we moved to make the counter free. That is correct. We sure did. So, while she's getting the otoscope, you're always, 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 always going to do a otoscopy before you do your impressions. Even if it's you've already done it with that patient, I recommend you do it again, especially when you're new to ear impressions. Because you're going to be very heavily looking for shape of that canal. Shape and size and Blockages, direction. direction. So, this little lady's canal does this a little bit. Ooh. And the main reason you want to do that is because when you put that Oda block in in a minute, you're not going to be able to see past your Oda block anymore. So if you don't know the direction of the ear canal, guess what you're going to do to that poor patient? Make them very uncomfortable. You're going to make them angry because you're going to be poking at their ear canal, um, which is just not a very comfy thing. They may jump a lot. Uh, you may hit the vagus nerve even more than you normally would. You may have a patient experience a lot of coughing, a lot of sneezing, a lot of whatever, uh, gagging. So, she's a medium. So, I pulled out two medium foam ones. Now, there are a couple of schools of thought on how to protect these strings from pulling off. You need to tie a knot somewhere. Now, cotton ones, you can tie a knot and tie it close to the foam. I mean, to the cotton. But when you do that to foam, it, it actually it. it actually kind of pulls it and compresses it. I don't know if y'all can see it well because of this being a video, but you see how it nipples in almost? It's going to change the shape of your actual And foam. it's going to cause a problem. And the only time I've ever actually seen a blow by on foam, barring somebody picking the complete wrong size, is because they tied the knot close in. And or they use fluids like the Odoes. I have seen that too. I agree with, with Burns. I tend so, to do it middle of the string. So, fast way. Don't try and do. Have your auntie, your tia, your grandma, whoever embroidered or so to help you learn to do this maybe. You wrap it around the finger so that it crosses, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just ball it up into a miserable mess by rolling it. And then pull it. And look, now we have a knot. Quick and fast. And like that took about... A and honestly, more than normal. I probably do it slightly different. Dr. Burns, can I steal one? And you mm -hmm. hold this for still for a minute. And it's really, again, still very easy. So okay. let me, uh, so I just take it. I do that same loop she does. I tuck this other end through, right? And I pull it. And you want to pull these afterwards just to make sure that it is secure. It should do that weird little nipply thing, right? What will happen if you don't knot it, and this gets in there, and this decides to come out, is you'll have the foam sitting down there, and the string has come out of this. Sometimes you'll see that they didn't do a good job. They didn't catch enough material, and it'll slip out. And then that just makes it harder to remove if your material has not actually made contact with your block. Mm -hmm. You'll hear these called dams. You'll hear them called blocks. You'll hear them called... There's another word I can't think of right now. They're all the same thing. So... You do both ears at the same time. Burns, I'm going to ask you a question. What's How that? did you decide your size? I did otoscopy. And what were you looking for? The size, the circumference of the ear canal. Right. Match. And here's the deal. The outside of the ear canal might look like a medium, 
but you know where you've got to place it, how deep you have to place it, which is All being the way to on the, the beyond the second bend and into the bony portion of the canal. Right. So if they have a sudden narrowing and they were a medium on the outside, but they're super narrow there, what It'll are you going to pick? Them. Well, first, if you're not sure, because it's hard to tell depth and size with one eye as you do with otoscopy, try the bigger one. What's the worst that can happen? It Could doesn't it be too shallow. fit, you pull it out and you go with the next size down. That's the worst that can happen. If you put too small of one in there and don't notice that it's too small, you can push it in you really can deep. cause yourself a problem. So, light on, to block into the ear. I'm gonna come around. And you want this. it to sit in the direction of the canal, kind of flattish like that. Boom, boom, boom. And then I don't just stab her like this. We are not fencing. Nope. We are going to come in eye level. There's gonna be some squatting to get to eye level. My hand is multiple fingers on the head. My other pinky finger from the pen light is sitting on her mastoid, and I'm pulling her ear, ear her penna back up and back to straighten the canal. Very then, similar to otoscopy, you're always going to want to brace anytime you're putting anything in the ear, especially during um, this stabbing, particular, stabbing because you've got a stabbiness. So we're gonna push in and feel, and I'm trying to make sure the string and the flat of that foam maintains its perspective. See how yeah. that string is still in the middle? I want it to go in. So I want the I want the canal as straight as I can so I can feed this foam through the circle of the canal as straight as possible. We don't want it to go sideways if we can help it. And it's super easy for that to happen, whereas she was showing you it's going sideways. It's not the end of the world. The problem with that is you may not get that seal you're wanting and you might increase you your chance created, of blow by. You've created a rounded that thing you for didn't it to go. Want. So the thing to, to know with foam is you'll see a lot of instructions that are like tap, tap, tap. That is for cotton. For foam, it is tap, tap, straighten, and then swoop. You want a continuous push because there is much more friction here. So if you tap, all it's going to do is spring. It's going to—it's springy. It's going to bounce back. It's got friction, so if you tap, it's not going anywhere. So I'm going to push this in past the second bend, and remember, I said her ear canal went up. So you see, the direction of her pin light is where it can push upward. Now. You're questioning, I'm sure, how do I know? How can I see? Well, eventually you do learn to see the second bend and feel it when you're going. But let's talk about the average length of an adult ear canal. It's 20 odd millimeters, right? This otoblock, you want it to sit two, three millimeters basically in front of the eardrum. That's what you're wanting. So, if you aren't good at visual spatial, let me show you a trick. You can use a ruler. So, get your own pull of thing or on here, we have them. So, if we have 22-ish millimeters, I would have it sitting here. This is gonna pull, push Give it a couple more right there, and you can literally take and color your tip of your light. Your tip of your light. So essentially, now when she goes back in here to check her lady, she can make sure that at least that much of the tip of her light is, is into in. this space. Now this so is it's not a real about, ear. It's about a. Th for me, I also know I've been doing this a while. It's slightly longer than a thumb width for me. That's how much is left on the mediums it's like an extra two and a half millimeters for the small ones it's less than it's about two millimeters less on the big ones but i knew it was right about there and i can look and right there that's how much we have left and then we do the same thing on the other ear we line it up in the concha bowl set it with your finger or set it with the pen tip you want it nice and flat when you start out. Mm -hmm. See how it's nice flat surface there? Hands all the way around. Now, 
Unlike otoscopy, we do not encourage you to switch hands. Not only do we not encourage you to switch hands, we also don't encourage you to pull up and back the whole time. You just do that initially when you get it in there. Because you're placing it, you don't want to change the shape of the canal. So, just get it in like that. Everything else is bracing. You actually keep it up for otoblock placement because you're dropping it oh, down. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking. It. I'm sorry. Yeah, I am yeah, thinking yeah. of actual uh, y'all. I'm jumping placement. ahead. Otoblock I'm, placement. You keep the ear up because it opens it, and then when you close it. Right. What I'm actually meaning is actually going to be the insertion of your materials. And I again, apologize. So this time, hands still on. Using this, and since you can't put this on the mastoid, it's going to go on the cheekbone this time. And I'm gonna, I'm good and forward and watch what I mean by the swoop. And then I back out. Do I need to repress? I tap a little bit because it went sideways. And then swoop. Boop. I and swooped there she it is. into the right spot. So that's otoblock placement. We're gonna put her to the side though for a minute. And we're going to talk about these ears. Now, these little fake ears don't go all the way in, and they're very, very shallow. So, we are not going to have y'all waste or use otoblocks on these little fake ears for the most part. So, these are what you're going to start with. So, what we need to do two ears is a scoop from each. So you have a catalyst that's the white and you have the base that is the uh, green. And your green side, the base side, may be a million different colors. We currently have green. There is some expired that we currently have in the clinic. These. You're that, gonna use these for fake. Right, so it says expired 2020. They're still gonna set up. They may take longer to set up than they normally would. We're not gonna use those oh, on patients. I my face. But certainly we are gonna use them for uh, practice. Yeah. And it's just a one-to-one -one with this particular material. You'll want to read any material you use to see if that's equals. There are some, I know, brands that there's more of the catalyst than there is of the base. Um, it just depends on what brand you purchase. But if you can't tell if the two are the same size, that's usually pretty It's almost one-to-one. -one. It's pretty good. And there are advanced stuff, but you're not doing advanced. You're not going to be like fudging it to get a different effect. Use the full mix. So... Pretend we've put Oto blocks in there, right? We've got our two syringes, I mean our two scoops, and then you want to start out with your syringe pulled apart and double check there's no big debris or anything in here. So, you take one out. First the base, then the catalyst. You smush them together and you mix it. Now, there's a multiple techniques. I do like a hand spleed. I spread it and fold it. I and the, spread it and fold it. And the spleeding method, you guys, is literally like if you've ever went to Marble Slab Creamery or someplace where they mix those toppings into ice cream and they use like a, a knife. It's that same kind mm -hmm. of method. You're going to take a knife against a wax paper and you're going to mix it that way together just Folding it in, folding it in, spreading and folding it. Basically, just like she's how I'm doing, doing it with, with my hands. Hand. Other people fold and punch and do, and I yeah. bleed with my hands. And the idea of splitting with the knife is just that, that you have no hands. Get. You have no hand contact, uh, and your hands don't get nasty. And then once you actually have See it. See how it's all one color? And it's oily, and it should be, but you wanted a consistent Snake it color. And push it in by a snaking and if you spleted it and you wanted to get all the material in there without touching you it, can you would literally just sort of uh rock your your thing over it until all the material was in the end and then you push it through don't squeeze it so much stuff comes out and then pull the edge off you just want it to the top once you kind of break the seal it kind of keeps doing that yeah then do not pull the ear up and back when you're doing this. Now, you don't touch the pinna at all. You brace a C around the ear with the other hand, like that. Don't touch the pinna. And then you put it in, and you want the trick to this is you angle it for the canal to start with, and then once it switches, once it gets to the um, 
tragus, don't expand it and turn a little bit till it gets into the. Um, okay, I'm gonna come around for this one. And then you do the so other I can see ear. Your movement. See, I'm in the canal side, and then I just change my angle to She's get it around. She's not really pulling away so much as she is turning. And see how she's staying with the material and in the material? If you don't stay with it, you're not staying in and it. You're going to create some bubbles and ripples. If there's anything left, put it in your hand and then just change direction to see how it goes. Yeah, play with it to see how it moves Flows and so moves. that you can get used to which direction you need to go to and fill that patient. And how much of the tip has to stay in. Because if I get out of the material, see it cake decorates. And here's the other thing I want you to notice. You see how this material is not hanging way out of the ear, right? It's relatively flush with the ear. If you put too much material and it's hanging out, it's actually going to change your impression because it's going to add all this weight out here. And as this hardens, it's going to pull that person's canal, right? The outer part mm -hmm. is cartilaginous. It's going to angle it. And then what's going to happen is you're going to get a hearing aid back that's been made from that impression or a ear mold made from that impression. And it's not going to fit. It's going to be very uncomfortable for that patient because that canal is not going in the direction that fits them best. Yep. So it's very important though to make sure you get, now depending on what you do, you may need a little bit more than he, this. If you're doing like a full shell and they are, what they're wanting specifies that you need the, what's that part called? You're talking about the anti-helix? Yeah, so some of them might specify that in which case you would fill right up into there. Yeah. so that you can capture it. But most of the time, my finding is what that causes is one that fits too tightly in there and the patient can't quite get it out. So most of the time, this is about how I'm gonna do. Now a kid with, with one, they might want you to actually fill it up and like do the full do ear. Do the full ear and get up there. So you just have to know what you're trying to get for that. And then if there's anything left, you can play with it. You can give it to the patient to play with it. I tell you, an, an 87 year old still wants to play with this. Oh yeah, so and fine. kids love to like roll them into balls and then when they get hard, they bounce a little bit mm -hmm. and they've got themselves a nice little silicone ball. So then what you do is you take any of the material that's still in there and you clean this and you wash it with soap and water. And if you're doing it for a real patient, you wash it with soap and water to get the oil and whatnot let it dry do not put a wet um a wet syringe into the sonic cleaner because it dilutes the solution but you need it to be clean it needs to be pre-cleaned before it gets sterilized yeah that oil will prevent the sterilization from working fully if you're not you've not removed most and of also it, so. it's kind of oil based itself and you end up with a gooky mess but if you're just practicing on fake ears you don't need to sterilize it just wipe it clean same with the spoons we can wipe them clean and do again. So let's we'll let those harden about how long? Um, normal. It depends on ambient temperature and humidity, which is a valuable thing. Cause I was thinking that a thing to learn that I did not know from personal experience. I was thinking we'd go outside and we'd like in a group socially distance, but it turns out when you get up above 90 degrees, which it's Southeast Texas and it is, um, it stays, it hardens before it can get out of the syringe. So we won't be doing that. But in like a room temperature building, depending on the brand, um, it's like five to seven minutes. Yeah. This is a little expired. So we're edging up to like seven to nine at this point in time. Um, and they, they, it definitely hardens slower in these fake ears because there's no heat yeah. and body heat. It goes faster. It's still one of those for a second. So one of the things that you're going to notice is if you start trying to mess with this before it's ready and tap so we can get this to focus there is, is if you press in on it, you're going to get a little nail mark and it's going to stay. You see how that nail mark's not really going fully away. There's still a little line right there. Which is a thing I am going to show you a purpose for when we do it on the head where yes. it will make more sense. But if it's that way, then it's not ready. And this one clearly isn't because it still has my fingernail on it. So we'll put that. Now let's get us another batch. Don't just touch things. Scrape it on the side. It doesn't have to be completely perfect. It just has to be close. And again... 
you have get two two standardized ears out of a scoop. You need to learn to be fast to do two ears because it hardens. So if you're like dilly dallying, it'll be too hard to do and you'll waste it. And it's like a dollar a scoop is about what it costs, which use it, learn, but don't be wasteful and let me see big wads of this that you've pulled yeah. out of syringes. Essentially, when you first start, chances of you having to mix up a second batch for a second ear is not going to be uncommon, but we want you to work really hard to get it where you don't have to. Or if you think that's a problem, see if you can do a half a scoop and half a scoop. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's not waste the material until you feel more comfortable and feel like you can do that and speed. And there are pre-measured ones that cost even more. Those are not for you. Yeah, they're going to be pink and white, and they're going to be in these little things called Weston singles. And they're not Like for little you. capsules. Those are for patients. And once you've passed all of this, if we give you permission, people always want to pull it. Um, a, they're harder to learn with because they're tighter and stiffer than this. Um, yeah, this is softer material being, for sure. But those you can get two ears out of too. So this is softer and more fluid. Um, and I will say, she's saying you can get two ears out. If you have a, an older gentleman with, with a you, giant ear or a patient who, of course, has like some sort of you know, medical condition where they've had a surgery and they've got a, a different side, that's going to be different. A you may have to absolutely, ear, but a standard ear, absolutely. And kids ears. Oh yes. So we're close by. My hand is all around. I'm getting eye level with her head. Now a real one would, um, be able to hold their head up, but she can't. So we're going to prop her. I get eye level in there and I shoot it and I'm being careful not to change the shape of the tragus and I pull out slowly because I feel it. And while she's pulling, notice again, she's turning. Change the direction, change the direction in there. That was a bit of a screw up. I looked instead. It's all right. Nobody perfect. And we're in. And again, and this is the part I meant to say that you don't want to pull the ear back up. And, and, and the main reason is, is because if it starts to harden while you're done in there and you've got it pulled a different shape, it's going to harden to the shape you've created. And if your hand is big enough to brace, you're supposed to brace with two hands. I literally don't have enough room to do it. I could never get licensed in the state of California because I would fail their licensing test. But there's material in, and see how I chatted, and it's getting tougher. So see the texture, and it's taking me a lot more effort. See, and that's the thing is, is if you wait too long, what this is going to cause in your patient's ear is it's going to get this whelping, and you're like going to have you're going to have these little ridges. And if it's in a significantly important place uh, for the, the manufacturer to make that air mold with, they may write you back and say, hey, we mm -hmm. can't make this, send us a new impression. And you don't want to have to call a patient back for a second impression. So this one I think is pretty good. It's pretty flush all the way around. It's full to where it needs to be for most of them unless I specifically need that. This one I turned away and didn't notice the how deep it. This one might be able to get away with it because I do have an outer edge and it does do the shell, but this is not ideal. This should have been a little bit fuller, but not so full that I would have pulled the, pushed the tragus out. And if you were doing, let's say a completely in the canal, that might not matter anyway. So the other thing I was saying that I was going to show y'all to do, and I needed to point this out and this is how I knew it was not going to be good, is sometimes you need directional microphones. So Directional microphones need to be parallel to the floor, kind of angled the way they do. Now, if you have a patient who has cathosis and they literally point this way, this is how they point. You will want to make and measure what's parallel to the floor because it's still in front of them. But most patients who sit upright, you can line up the plane with the nose. You can use a credit card. I most often just use this little handle. And then you can just press to show your axis of directionality. Like that. See, it's a little line. And that's just to help your manufacturer when they're placing those directional mics to put them in the way where it's actually gonna be, there's a good front mic, mm 
and a we good rear mat mic. mic. Because you, every once in a while, you'll get a hearing aid in and you'll be like, what is up with this? Because it's doing something funky and the patient's complaining about how it's cutting out people's voices and what have you. And it's either actually a or reverse a wired. Of, yeah, backwards. Or it's because they didn't have the axis of directionality to know what was parallel and they placed them the best they could. And it really wasn't parallel for that patient. Okay, so... See how I push my thumb and oh. nothing happens? Let me fix the... There we go. Go for it. I push my thumb and nothing happens. Right, everything so, bounces back. In a real patient, what you want to do is break the seal. You just kind of wiggle up and down. You can even motion to the patient, move your jaw. Uh-huh. Ah, like that. Because if they'll chew and move their mouth, that even helps as well. So you push... And then sometimes if you need to, you can kind of tug on the string to break the seal if they seem a little uncomfortable. Um, and then you just get your fingernail under or whatnot or pull it here. See how there's usually a tiny bit of a little thing here. And that's usually where I recommend because then even if you don't have nails, you see how I, can, I don't have any nails, I can still pull mm -hmm. up and grab. And then I can grab it and pull it out. Yep. Or... You can, and since we're telling you to keep your nails shut, show it short. Although this is pretty short, you don't need much, but you can. On a lot of people, you can pull, you can push the um, this part, right? The words. Why can't I remember any anatomy today? I don't know. I can't. So you can fold this Kifasa. up. I can remember kephosis, but not like ear anatomy. <laughs> so, but you can kind of just pull and get it here too. Now. Depending on the shape of their ear canal, you may pull it straight up or you may twist it. And this one, it helps to twist it. And see how it went all the way into the end. And there's no, like there is a line, but that is an actual line of the mold. Right. You, and that's one thing you're going to notice. Some of yours will have this this little bloop. You see, oh, let me get this to uh, focus on this better. There we go. You see that little bloop? You want to just check and make sure, is that something I did or is that something that the ear has in it? Because on these not real people's ears, there may literally be a place that corresponds mm -hmm. to this line. But you see how it's smooth otherwise? And it's all the way up in here, but not like right. huge, big wad of material. And the material is nice and smooth. There's no weird whelping. There's no unusual what happened. And you can it. see the edge of where the anti-helix rolls. You can see the edge of where it starts. You don't have the whole thing, but they know what's from here. They know what's flat and flush. So, break the seal. This thing is just wanting to change its... Uh... Get in here. And then remember which shape it went. And this one, it's kind of a roll forward. And this one, I didn't get a good angle on. See? Pretty sure that's a me and not a... Yeah. Let's check. That's there. Yep, that was that was a me not getting all the way in there. Now, how much of a problem is that? It depends on what I'm making. Doing a canal with lock, it's not even going to go there. Same with here. I didn't quite get it all the way filled in there. If I needed a helix lock, this wouldn't be a good impression. I wouldn't turn this in. I would have to redo it. Right. So this is an example of a failed one with its missing helix and its void here in the concha, those, that's a failure. This one is a pass with all of that. Correct. And I mean, this one I would say classic. You see on this side how, um, how smooth that is. Yeah, there's some tiny, tiny air bubbles, but that would be classically how you'd want it to look. Now, what I'm going to tell you is you see how this looks kind of matte? In a real person's ear, they're going to have oil. And so this may actually even appear shiny from the oil mm -hmm. from their ear, but you should still have that kind of texture. Whereas this, oh, let me being a failure. Focus. There we go. Right. So she's missing some key anatomy that if this was a shell hearing aid, especially if it was going to have a helix lock, it would be it would not incorrect. be a, a good fit. So our lady love, Susie Ken. Susie Ken, Susie Ken. Now, Susie has these like hard, stiff ears. 
it's going to be hard to break the seal on somebody with that kind of stiff ear. To do that, what I do with the stiff ear people, the soft ear people are easy. The stiff ear people, I grab them here, yes, by the chin. You have to be all up in the business. And you grab the skin in front of the tragus here. Yep, and, and this pinna and, and pull back. forward and back together like this. And, and then, then I separate this. The and again, ones. if you can, if you can convince them through vocal, for, through, uh -huh. through motions, go, uh, most of them are going to copy you. Uh-huh. That helps. That too. helps as well. So you kind of just do there and then we get in here. And I'm going to ask you to not do proper procedure so we can see for a second. So she's rolling kind of forward, forward. getting and out. It in. Because of the shape of the ear canal, most of the time you're going to be rolling forward. Most people. See, it can get old plastic hair everywhere. Yep. And see, this had this did turn a little bit, so it was sitting instead of like ideal perfect textbook, it would have been sitting here on the flat. Right. But. I didn't get it, so it was pointing this whole barrel roll. And if that happens and you have this with a patient where it's turned, this is not the end of the world. What you want to make sure is, do you still have the length of canal you want? Did it change the shape of the canal? And if it didn't, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. And this would be fine for the canal and the concha, but not for the helix lock. If you needed a helix lock, this one would be bad. Yep. While well, she does that, I'm going to turn Miss Susie Ken around. So, again, we're going to break it. Breaky, breaky. Breaky. Breaky, breaky. Like I said, around the jaw, press here. And I'm going to, again, ask Dr. Burns to not follow protocol. And I'm going to have her pull it out so we can still watch her pull it out. So, she's not bracing appropriately, which is weird for her. She's making faces, but we're going to do it. So you just kind of wedge see. this in. You're grabbing a hold of that top. They're going to make faces sometimes, by the way, when you're doing this, like you're pulling their brains out. You can ask them if they're uncomfortable, if it looks really bad, but most of the time it's just because it's a weird sensation. Yep. And Susie Kent's hair is a pain in the booty today. So. This was the one she was worried about. <laughs> yep. So this one, I didn't get the material all the way deep in. Yep. I mean, it's a long enough canal for most because it's after the first and it's closing in the second, but the material didn't go all the way in. See, it didn't go all the way mm -hmm. where I wanted to. It's not a long enough canal. Did a better job on the helix on this one, though. Mm -hmm. It's still got a little, but it's for the most part good. But you're looking for all those major points of anatomy. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking in uh, your hearing aids class about you know which parts of those are more important than others and it depends on what you're trying to order if you're mm -hmm. ordering a short canal for somebody with a, like severe vasobagal thing you may even purposefully Chris want Lee. to make it a short canal in those cases yeah. because sometimes you'll get yourself a manufacturer who thinks they know better but for the most part they're good uh but if, mm -hmm. if they can't make it longer because they can't make it longer because you didn't give them longer well there you go yeah or um you know somebody has um like a restriction, like it narrows down and then it opens back up, you may need to stop short for that. Right. Um, if that's the case, especially until you're experienced, much like you'll learn with mastoid bowls, for me, at least, if you're going to purposefully stop short because of a restriction, I'm going to want you to pack further in with some cotton ones to like brace your, your thing so that it will not go any deeper. Um, yeah. Even if it does on the restricted ones, you can usually still pull them out, but that is a bad day for everybody involved. So if you are purposefully making a short canal for some reason, I'm gonna want you to put a couple extra Oda blocks back there to fill up the blank space. And then really, the only thing we have left, guys, is you'd make sure you do otoscopy again. And why? We want to make sure we didn't leave nothing behind. You didn't leave anything you didn't mean to leave. And again, get down and eye level and look. No damage, no whatever. If you, for some reason, see you did leave something behind or you you see a little irritation, don't panic and immediately be like, <gasps> You can say. You can say, I'd like, especially since you're new, I'd like my supervisor to take a look too and see how that looks. 
And if there's something in there that can be easily removed by curette, hey, we just need to make or sure forceps. we whatever, we're going to grab Let me this pull out. that piece of foam out. Let me and pull. boom, 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 the end. Or, all right, and now it's time to do the, time to do the tympanometry, just to check to make sure everything's moving the way you want. You know, you can just be very blase. Okay, now it's time to do the da-da-da-da. And again, then if it ends up being a problem, you're going to be honest about it. Yep. But it, don't panic the patient over something that may be very simple. So I think that I think that's all it. The parts. Y'all will be practicing these wonderful things. We have you oh, start on the little ears. That's no, that one thing. So noticing how stiff this was, part of that problem is this one has a very short. Um, this my little stubby one well, isn't just stubby this way. It's also stubby there. In length. So this actually was not an appropriate <laughs> syringe choice for Miss Susie Ken here, which is part of why I couldn't get it into the canal the way I needed to, because it literally doesn't have enough room or length. See how the, the fatness of this and the shortness of this did. combined so is bad. You put this one or this one and these ones you could have gotten a little bit deeper in the canal. There's even one once you get experienced. Um, so these are like, this one's discontinued, I can't get anymore. So if you need it, like let me know, but don't wander off. These are like $5, I think. These are like $15, and then they make some ones that are even thinner here, and they're like $22 a syringe. So those won't be in your kit, but once you learn how to do, they are here and available for use. And then the, um, the other thing I want to point out, Dr. Burns keeps telling you guys about these costs of these things. Really start to take, take stock in that. If you guys one day decide, hey, I'm going to start a private practice when I finish, and you think, oh, well, that's just a dollar. No, that's just $5. That, those costs add up rather quickly. And so it's really important for you to start thinking about those things now. In your third year class, you will have uh, both a business course uh, about private practice and other, uh, the, the, really other organizational things you need for the for the practice of private practice and other uh, and it's parts where you might have a little more admin. Um, so, for instance, most sites have these. They're cheap. Mm -hmm. They're cheap. However, if you know what it costs and you're aware of how much impression material and shipping charges are, you can say, hey, look, I know this syringe is $21, but my experience with it is that I have fewer remakes that I have to do and fewer returns, which right. then, then it's worth it. You can justify a $21 cost if you know it costs that and how much each of these impressions make and shipping is $19.99. And sure. And again, I know sometimes that we get to in, in our head, well, you know, a, a Coke's a dollar or something. Well, but when you need it every day for multiple patients, those costs add up. So, you know, it's really important to keep those things in mind. Right. There you go. Say bye to Susie again. Bye.